Welcome to Mondo Agora on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Today we're going to be talking about serial killers, continuing our discussion from last week, and we're going to be covering the topic of John Wayne Gacy. This is part one of a two-part episode. It's a lot of ground to cover here. Um, and today we're going to be listening to the excellent music of Anthony Rajeko. So enjoy, and I hope you learned something. Tune in next week for the conclusion of this exciting episode. As always, my name is Bean. Enjoy. We're going to start with John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown. He's not really what he appears to be at first glance. He's not at all what I really expected him to be. You see a picture of him, and you know he's this tubby guy, and you know he dressed as a clown, and you know he did this horrible stuff, and you get this idea in your head about his personality and what he probably you know, acted like. You saw it of him, and in reality, it's almost the exact opposite. So I guess the best place to start would be kind of a brief overview of his childhood, where it all started. And the best place to start is with his dad. He had real daddy issues. John's dad, also named John, was also a giant piece of shit. He was extremely abusive, both mentally and physically towards his son. He really wanted a manly man type of son. And to do so, to, to make his son more manly, he treats him harshly. Tough love, that whole avenue and say kind of backfires you know his mom is, is gentle and kind towards him so he starts kind of drifting more towards her uh, he apparently starts becoming jealous because he thinks that she and John Jr. John Wayne Gacy the killer clown who would become keeping secrets from him and you know John secretively was like dressing up in his mom's underwear and stuff like that. He, uh, he wanted to do the kind of activities that his sisters did. He had three sisters. He had no other siblings. And his sisters, you know, they would dress up pretty clothes. They would do things like uh, they would garden. Things that his dad would consider women's chores or female work. And uh, that's what stuff John wanted to do. But his dad was like, why don't you want to go fishing? Why don't you want to play football? You know, tough, manly, that kind of stuff. Um, so his dad, I guess, in denial from that, also drank a lot. And when he drank, he beat his kids, um, especially John, because John was the disappointment the only time John ever hears like a positive word from his dad, like, I'm proud of you type of thing, which is what he always wanted, was um, was much later. Now, I'm going to mention it. It's kind of important, but we'll go back to it later. Casey was also knocked out by his father using a broomstick. He uh, also had a heart condition which kept him from playing with other children, kind of made him a loner. And his dad would return, routinely call him things like sissy, pussy. Um, his, his dad was, you know, kind of counting on him doing well in school because he wasn't 
you know, going to make it doing anything else, he thought. And he didn't do very well in school. He did okay. He was, you know, bright, but he missed a lot of days because of his heart problems. His dad didn't believe it existed. Some people, they think that when Gacy got knocked out by his dad, he was broomstick that uh, it damaged the part of his brain that made him feel emotions um, anyway when he was nine years old he was molested by a family friend he didn't tell anybody because he was ashamed by it he thought that his dad would be angry at him for it so he didn't tell anybody but his guy was a carpenter or a contractor and to me it sounds like this guy is who he emulated later in life. You know, he, he went around and molested little boys as a, or not, some of them were little boys, uh, little boys and teenage boys, and uh, is a contractor. That was like his, his job. Uh, he was big and he was really good at it. You know, he had a big business. So as soon as Gacy was able, he moved away from the and he ended up working as an ambulance driver and then as a mortuary assistant. And it was while, while he was a mortuary assistant that he came across a dead body and he walked up against it and became aroused by it. And that scared him. I guess it would scare anybody. It was really, really fucked up. It was gross. Um, so he, uh, calls his dad and asks if he can move back in. And he, he allows him. And he moves back in and he starts going to business college. Now, there's something I, I wanted to kind of go ahead and get out there about Casey's personality. He had some uh, a lot of similarities with with Ted Bundy. And one of the major similar similarities is they were both really charismatic guys. And this is the biggest surprise with Gacy, because you wouldn't get that just by looking at him. But he, uh, he was a smooth talker, which, you know, really kind of made him excel at the business world. So he really found the home there. Yeah, unlike, unlike um, Bundy, though, he, Gacy was a Democratic Party candidate. He, uh, he started out when he was 18 supporting a Democratic Party candidate, and then he ran for office, small office the following year. His dad, for the first time of his life, told him the truth, said that he was a patsy. Um, <laughs> but he, uh, you know, he kind of worked his way up in that system. I don't think he wanted any of those elections, but he, you know, he made a lot of headway, met a lot of people that were high up. So after he finished college, he, he goes off and he gets a job working at a shoe company in Springfield, Illinois. And um, this is kind of around the first time when he makes his first kind of successful move. And I, I think this is kind of impressive. This guy does something twice that a lot of people can't do once. He does makes successful living. That is not an easy thing to do. He makes a lot of money. And the first time, it's not really all him, so I'm not sure how fair it is to say that. He, he starts working at this company. He's doing well there. And he starts to date this woman. And she's from a really good family, a really wealthy family, I say. Um, her dad owned a bunch of fried chicken, Kentucky fried chicken restaurants in Iowa. So, you know, they date. John, he knows, you know, if he, if he marries this woman, he will inherit the keys to this Kentucky fried chicken. So he does. He marries this woman. Her dad puts him in charge. He has to go and finish uh, management school or something. And he has to train at the company. So he works there for a while. And, you know, before he takes 
over as management. And when he takes over as management, that's when his dad says, you know, I was wrong about you, you made me proud. Because he made a lot of money. He made a successful life for himself. And his dad, I guess, didn't think he had it in him to do so. But it's not like he built those Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurants from the ground. He married him, but he was working really hard at the job he had before then, and apparently he was doing really well at it. He continued to do well um, after moving to Iowa and taking over these Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurants. He, you know, fell right through the business of and the people there really liked him. He became a pillar of their community, as you would say. He joined the group known as the JCs, and they are the basically junior staples. They did you know, charity work and stuff like that. It made him stick out more in the community. And during this time, you know, he becomes, like when they moved to Iowa, really quickly he is made the, uh, the vice president of the Springfield chapter of the JCS, which is, is quite an honor. So him, you know, he was, he's always a big fan of Continue to branch up it there. Murdered it, signed up a bunch of uh, inmates. So it's like a prison JC chapter. And anyway, during this time period, not when he's in prison, he has his he has a homosexual experience. One night when he's drunk, you know, he gets drunk and somebody else gets drunk and he and he gives somebody, some guy, a blowjob or something. And he didn't tell anybody about it. He kind of feels bad about it. He feels good about it. It's tearing him up inside. Life was going really good for, for John at this time. He, uh, him and his wife had two kids. And he won awards for being the vice president of the Iowa chapter of JC's. But there was a darker side to the JC's. It, that he was really deeply involved in. He signed up a whole bunch of members for the, the JCs by having parties that involved, you know, large scale orgies, prostitution, things like that. Um, the the whole JC community on the whole had this underside that was involved in wife swapping and pornography and prostitution. And, you know, junior status is just how they operate. It's, you know, wrong for everybody else. It's okay for them. I know, you know, they don't make laws or anything the JC, but, I mean, I think the point still stands. They just did whatever they wanted, and they were a kind of quasi-governmental group. They kind of, kind of want to be, but they emulate the same behavior on a smaller scale. A lot of times if you watch a documentary or something about John Wayne Gacy, they pass off his first wife as kind of a victim of his you know, cheating and promiscuous behavior. But she was you know, pretty much right there with him. She went out and went over with other guys and stuff like that. Pretty much because he wanted her to maybe, but she still did it. And I mean, I guess at some point, something in her liked it, or she wouldn't have done it at all. I mean, at least she she liked it enough to do it for him, you know? So, at that point for what it is, but uh, maybe she was kind of the perfect, quote unquote, woman for him, as far as women go for that guy, the way she acted about the most compatible he's ever been able to find. He had a, another wife later going to that. So Gacy got this kid. It was a fellow JC member's son to come over to his house. He lured him over by offering to show him the porn and got him drunk, got him to watch porn with him, and then got the kid to give him a sex and told the kid you know not to tell anybody about it. and 
he didn't for a long time. And Casey molested other kids, a whole bunch of other kids. Some people he told it was for scientific research. That's crazy, but they're little boys, you know, so telling them anything, they'll believe it if it's coming from a perceived authority figure. Casey also tricked one kid into sleeping with his wife. Oh no, her, his wife was in on some of this stuff. And then blackmailed him for it into giving him a, you know, giving him more sex. He's a truly despicable person. And he hid it well from people. Nobody knew about this. Even the, the kid's daddy first molested him. Didn't guess about this at all. And then you know, one day he tells his dad, and you know, his dad goes to the police, and the police arrest him. He was charged with sodomy, oral sodomy, and attempted assault on a 16 year old. And he denied it, he denied it, denied it, denied it, and took a polygraph, a lot of techniques, and he failed it big time. The officers who performed it jokingly said the only time that he told the truth on the polygraph is when he said his name. But everybody knows that polygraphs are really not admissible and you're not really accurate, but everybody knows he did it, right? But he never said that he did. I don't think he ever really admitted to doing anything. Every time he got back into a corner where you know, he was, you know, proved to have had sexual intercourse with these young people, that he, uh, he forced into it or tricked into it in some way, he always said that they wanted it and it was their fault. So it sounds just like any rapist to me. Anyway, he was convicted, thrown in jail, uh, prison. So Gacy got a couple of years for child molestation and was paroled after a year for being a model prisoner. He was in a very short time made the uh, prison chef. There's even a video online um, of him talking to a news reporter as the chef in this prison. It's kind of weird to see that, that perspective. Apparently he throbbed in the prison environment. Maybe that's why it didn't scare him. It didn't keep him away. But um, he was paroled. 12 months of probation. In 1970. He did the, uh, the act, say, in 68. So, see how long it kind of carried on. And, how long they punished him for, for such a terrible thing. But um, when he was paroled and after his, you know, they finished probation and everything, he very successfully hit this woman. Nobody knew, the people that knew him, you know, as a family man, that they did not have any idea that he went to prison. Upon his release, Gacy moved to Chicago to live with his mom. His dad has since died. And he quickly got a job as a short order cook at a little cafe. And then he very quickly gets arrested for sexually assaulting a teenager. And then he gets the, the case gets dismissed when the teenager doesn't show up for court to testify against his attacker. Gacy and his mom move into this house that she bought. This becomes the infamous Gacy house. Gacy also at this time starts dating this woman. She was divorced, she had two kids, and when she was gonna move in, his mom moved out. And during this time, a week before he's supposed to get married, he gets charged with battery for forcing a teenage boy to get the moral sex in a car. 
Anyway, this case gets dismissed when the boy tries to blackmail John. Which I don't really see how one crime kind of dismisses the other. So the guy tries to, to get money from Gacy and because of this it's thrown out even though he molested a young boy. So Gacy marries this divorced woman and moves her into his house. He then quits his job as a cook and he starts his own business. And this is a construction company or a contractor company. It's called PDM Contractors, which stands for Painting, Decorating, and Maintenance. And it became a big business. By 1978, they had an annual turnover of $200,000. So he was making money. He did really good at his job. But that wasn't enough to keep him I'm a crazy psycho killer. So this is the part of his life where Gacy starts to put his face back together, as you could say. He, uh, you know, puts off the persona of being a family man again. He's married, he's got a wife, he also has these two new daughters. Uh, even though he doesn't see his first family at all. They, they break off contact with him completely after he's sent to prison the first time. But he also, instead of just being a businessman, he gets involved in democratic politics again. Starts working for the Democratic Party. And doing this, he meets First Lady Rosalind Carter. That's Jimmy Carter's wife. And um, there's a picture. You can see this picture of, uh, of John Wayne Gacy shaking hands with the First Lady here. And it's signed to John Gacy. Best wishes, Rosalind Carter. And he's wearing a a button in the picture and it's it's got an S pin an S on the pin and it basically simplifies that he was checked out by the Secret Service and he passed out as A-OK -okay. you know, a good guy it was also during this time that he, uh, he joined the local Moose Club and he, he came across a bunch of members who did this thing called Jolly Joker where they dressed up as clowns and went to entertain kids hospitals, children's hospitals, things like that. He created the character Pogo the Clown, and this is where the whole clown persona comes from. Now, he killed a lot of people. Over 30, people aren't really sure precisely how many or exactly when the first one was, but um, he didn't do many of them in clown makeup, but it, it knows that he it's known that he attacked at least one person dressed as a clown. So that whole idea of a killer clown stalking people is not completely inaccurate, but it's not nearly 100%. It's kind of just a side thing. At some point, John tells his wife that he's bisexual. And in 1975, after having sex, he tells her that they're never going to have sex again. She begins seeing him bring young boys into the garage, finding um, gay pornography all around the house, and in a year, what took her that long, she divorced him. And that's really what set him off the deep end. He killed people before, before they got divorced, but it's always been kind of low-key and slow and really picked up the pace at this point because there, he didn't have anything holding him back. His wife was almost like a leash holding that dog. And when that leash came off, he just broke off that chain, just started tearing everything to pieces he could get his hands on. Also, John's business took off and with it, he expanded. You know, he needed to hire new employees hired a lot of young men who began to disappear. It's one of the ways he found, found his victims. So John almost got busted a number of times. He really wasn't being that careful and he, you know, it wasn't for the ineptitude of the cops, he wouldn't have gotten away with it for so long. He, uh, he you know, disappeared a number of young children or young men who um, their parents called the police.
Police and was like, hey, look at this guy. And he even sold one of the kids' cars to somebody else and then said the kid ran away. And that was kind of his excuse for these people. Like, hey, these kids just ran away. I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't even know this kid. He, or I, he, you know, he barely worked for me and he said something about hating his life here and running off somewhere. And the cops just kind of believed him because he was, you know, a quote-unquote respectable businessman. And, you know, he did have a way with words. If you listen to any, any of his, you know, his interviews, he's very logical sounding. He sounds like a nice guy. It's not, obviously. But he's, he comes off that way. So I can see how they can believe him to an extent. But they had evidence linking him and they just didn't follow it. And he... You know, he kept killing. He killed 30-some people. Just terribly. He tricked them into putting on handcuffs a lot of times. They killed him over. They thought of him a lot of times as a friend or something. And he choked them. He did something what he called his magic rope trick. Where he put a rope around their neck and then put a, a rod in it and twisted it until they suffocated him. This caused him sexual gratification. That's why he kept doing it. So, next week we'll continue where we left off and we'll go into the real details of the police's ineptitude in stopping this crazy man. They're supposed to protect us from these people, right? <laughs>